part of it. We're going to stop before Paul gets to Athens. So I'm reading from the Passion Translation. Um, so let's see where we go. After passing through the cities of Amphipolis and Apollonia, Paul and Silas arrived at Thessalonica. As they customarily did, they went to the synagogue to speak to the Jews from the Torah scrolls. For three weeks, Paul challenged them by explaining the truth and proving to them the reality of the gospel, that the Messiah had to suffer and die, then rise again from among the dead. He made it clear to them, saying, I come to announce to you that Jesus is the anointed one, the Messiah. Some of the Jews were convinced that their message was true. So they joined Paul and Silas, along with quite a few prominent women and a large number of Greeks who worshipped God. But many of the Jews were motivated by bitter jealousy and formed a large mob out of the troublemakers unsavoury characters and street gangs to incite a riot. They set out to attack Jason's house for he'd welcomed the apostles into his home. The mob was after Paul and Silas and sought to take them by force and bring them out to the people. But when they couldn't find them, they took Jason instead, along with some of the brothers in his house church and dragged them before the city council. Along the way, they screamed out, those troublemakers who have turned the world upside down have come here to our city. And now Jason and these men have welcomed them as guests. They're traitors to Caesar, teaching that there's another king named Jesus. Their angry shouts stirred up the crowds and troubled the city and all its officials. So when Paul and Silas came before the leaders of the city, they refused to let them go until Jason and his men posted bail. That night, the believers sent Paul and Silas off to the city of Berea, where they once again went into the synagogue. They found that the Jews of Berea were of more noble character and much more open-minded than those of Thessalonica. They were hungry to learn and eagerly received the word. Every day, they opened the scrolls of scripture to search and examine them, to verify that what Paul taught them was true. The large number of Jews became believers in Jesus, along with quite a few influential Greek women and men. And when the news reached the Jews in Thessalonica that Paul was now in Berea, proclaiming the word of God, the troublemakers went there too, and they agitated and stood at the crowds against him. The fellow believers helped Paul slip away to the coast of the Aegean Sea, while Silas and Timothy remained in Berea. Well, what a to-do yet again. It seems as if we could just keep the same narrative and change the name of the place at the top, because the same thing keeps happening to Paul and his companions wherever they go. So what can we learn today from this passage? Apart from if Paul invites you to go traveling with him, just make your excuses and stay away. Well, firstly, I think we shouldn't let setbacks deter us. Paul's first arrest was in Philippi, which we looked at last week, because Paul had cast out a disobedient spirit from a slave girl, resulting in her being no longer able to prophesy. Her angry owners, knowing that they could no longer profit from her demonic services, dragged Paul and Silas to the marketplace to face the authorities. The magistrate there ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods and then they were thrown into prison, where they were fastened in the stocks. Now, if that were me, after I'd been released from prison, I would have got away from there as fast as possible and kept my head down. But what did Paul do? Well, he traveled 100 miles to Thessalonica. And what's the first thing he did? He went into the synagogue again and began teaching that Jesus is the Christ again. And it caused uproar. A riot broke out 
and the instigators searched for Paul and Silas to drag them before the city leaders. Now, fortunately for those two, they couldn't be found. Unfortunately for Jason, who'd been housing them, he and the other believers were imprisoned until Jacob, uh, Jason paid bail to release them. Well, Paul and Silas then left Thessalonica and fled to Berea. Well, Paul did the same thing. He doesn't learn, does he? The man was unstoppable in his commitment to the gospel of Christ. As a result of knowing Jesus Christ personally, Paul said that he did all things for the sake of the gospel. He said that he had counted as loss everything in his life that had formerly been gain in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus as his Lord. And when in prison in Philippi, he wrote, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Even persecution didn't deter his zeal for the gospel. So that's my first challenge to myself and maybe to you too. Is my life characterized by complete devotion to Jesus? Jesus taught us to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And in Revelation 3, we read a warning to the church in Laodicea, which says he will spew them out of his mouth because they are lukewarm in their commitment. Where am I? Where are you on the commitment scale? Secondly, verse six is variously translated as the apostles caused trouble all over the world, or in several translations, like in one we read, they were accused of turning the world upside down. And that was because they were proclaiming there was a king other than Caesar who was called Jesus. I love that we should be called people who turn the world upside down. Admittedly, it was leveled at Paul as a criticism, but I think we should see it as really positive. We live in a society which has on many fronts gone away from God, and that's a challenge. But also, what a privilege to be able to turn things upside down, because only Jesus can turn things upside down, making things become the right way up again. This accusation was made against Paul because he was speaking about the kingship of Jesus. So how does that translate for us today? I came across something that Reverend Stephen J. Cole had written and he said, we live in a world that has brazenly cast off God. We have cast him off as the creator, insisting that science proves that we all evolved from pond slime through sheer chance billions of years ago. So if God is not creator, then he doesn't need to be obeyed. If man is simply the product of millions of years of chance, then he need not fear judgment or eternity ahead because at death he simply ceases to exist. So we can determine for ourselves what is right and what is wrong because there is no absolute moral truth binding on everyone except for the absolute truth that there is no absolute truth. Thus tolerance becomes our chief virtue. So in this culture, how do we live lives that demonstrate the kingship of Jesus. Well, every time we show his love, we proclaim his kingship. When we encourage and affirm rather than libel and belittle, we demonstrate the kingship of Jesus. When we forgive, we demonstrate the kingship of Jesus. When we give sacrificially and put others' needs before our own, we demonstrate not only the love, but the kingship of Jesus. When we refuse to let our integrity be compromised, we demonstrate the kingship of Jesus. 
When we fight for the rights of the poor and the oppressed, we demonstrate the kingship of Jesus. To upset the world for Jesus Christ, we need to be men and women who are committed to Christ and the gospel, not just in word, but in deed too. And sometimes it's in the little things that God works. When I was teaching in Chichester, I was asked to accompany a school trip on an outdoor pursuits week in Wales. Now, for those of you who know me, I'm not the adventurous type really. So I presumed I was only invited because I was Welsh. But anyway, we arrived in the evening, we got everybody into bed, all the kids just in their dorms. Oh, and as adults, we sat down in the lounge when there was a knock on the door. James, not his real name, was in his bunk crying. Please, could I come? So off I went. And James was in the bottom bunk, a year seven student who'd never been away from home before and was desperately missing mum and dad. So I sat with him, held his hand and I chatted with him until he fell asleep. And each night I would do the same. It was quite a challenging trip for me. Orienteering and hiking were okay, but canoeing and windsurfing were more problematic because I can't swim. But I did manage both with the aid of a wetsuit and life jacket. And then the last day was caving. Now, as someone who's claustrophobic, that was a huge challenge for me. But I'll tell you that story another day. Well, that was in the year 1987. When those of you who are old enough to remember Michael Fish, the weather presenter, saying on the lunchtime news, earlier on today, apparently a woman rang the BBC and said she heard there was a hurricane on the way. Well, if you're watching, don't worry, there isn't. That night, the storm was the worst to hit Southeast England for three centuries, causing record damage. I woke up the next morning to find a boat in my garden and part of my roof dislodged. I live next door to um, a walkway and some of the coping stones were precariously balanced, which meant they could fall off any time and seriously hurt somebody. Well, not knowing any roofers, I simply opened yellow pages. If you're old like me, you remember them. And I rang the first person on the list. He said he would come around to have a look. Well, I invited him in to have a cup of tea while he did the quote. And we fell into conversation during which time he asked me what I did. And when I told him I was a teacher, he asked me where. But when I, I told him, he looked at me in astonishment and said, you're the one who looked after our James on the school trip when he was homesick. We can't thank you enough. And to say thank you, of course, there will be no charge for me repairing your roof. It's the little things. Maybe it wasn't because I was Welsh, I was invited on the trip. Maybe it was because I could show the love of Jesus to this little boy when he was struggling. Might not seem earth shattering or anything extraordinary, but Jesus said, when you care for one of the, the least of these little ones, you demonstrate your love for me. And by our actions, we express the kingship of Jesus. Thirdly, I want to look at Berea. It's only mentioned in Acts 17 and in passing in Acts 20, where we're told that Sopater joined Paul and Sopater was the son of Pyrrhus from Berea. That's it in chapter 20. And yet, the name of the Bereans are well known in Christian circles. Why? Because we are told that they were more noble in character and more open-minded and listened to what Paul had to say. When Paul went to them, they hadn't yet encountered Jesus. But as devout Jews, they were used to studying the scriptures daily. So when Paul talked to them about Jesus, they listened eagerly, but they didn't, <coughs> excuse me, 
They didn't just take everything at face value, but they checked it out with scripture to see if what Paul was saying was true. They were a people who held the scriptures in such high regard that they studied the word every day. And because they were familiar with the word, they saw the truth of Paul's message about Jesus Christ. And so they believed. The Bereans had a real love of the scriptures, which meant they didn't just read them, but they studied them and they used them as a tool to help them live. Today, we have so many resources at our fingertips to help us understand scripture, as well as the Holy Spirit to help us understand. So do we read and avidly digest what the word says? Along with Jane, who some of you know, I run a book group and we all read the same book each month and then meet up to discuss it. Obviously, it's been much more complicated to do this during, during lockdown. And I guess some of you like me have found this last lockdown really hard. And I've only read two books this year. It's just been too much effort to concentrate. And I know it's because I've struggled with motivation during the last few months. You'll be reassured to know that I've just started to read again. But for me, a spiritual check of where I am in my walk with God is how keen am I to read the Bible? When it becomes a cursory read or a quick scan, then I know I'm not where I should be or where I want to be. I want to emulate the Bereans and read and enjoy and learn and live by scripture. And sometimes, hopefully most times, it will be an absolute joy. But at other times, it may take more effort. But 2 Timothy 3, Paul says, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction and training in righteousness that the man and woman of God may be competent and equipped for every good work. I want to be equipped for every good work, don't you? And fourthly and finally, what I think we can take from, them, from this passage to help us today. Paul knew his calling and he had a clear vision. We read at the start of this chapter that Paul passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia and went to Thessalonica. Now Thessalonica was a thriving city of about 200,000 people at that time. It was a major port and a thriving commercial center, but that's not why Paul went there. He went there, the reason was they had a synagogue because Paul wanted to persuade the Jews that Jesus was the long awaited Messiah. So he went to where there were communities of Jews. We're told that Amphipolis and Apollonia didn't have any synagogues. So he passed through them. Apparently Thessalonica had 36 synagogues at the time of Paul. We know that the first thing he did was he went to the synagogue because his mission, first of all, was to go to the Jews. And then little is known of Berea, other than it had a good water source, which was utilised in growing fruit trees. But it seems to have been a bit of a backwater, yet it had a Jewish community, so Paul travelled there. See, he had a strategy, and he was focused on where he was going, and what his purpose was. Yet again, I was quite challenged by this, because I tend to be reactive rather than proactive. But as we look at how to be church in these times, I guess we all need to know where we fit and what God is asking of us. Each of us is unique. And Ephesians tells us that we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared for each of us in advance. All of us has a role. Some of us, maybe more strategic than others. And so we might want to join in in what others are doing. But what is in your hand? 
What is God stirring you up about? It might be something new, or it might be to continue something you already have started and have a passion for. You see, Paul started off preaching to the Jews, but then he became an apostle to the Gentiles. Is God asking you to let go of something and to embrace something new? Further on in his letter to the Ephesians, Paul says, I keep asking the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. What a beautiful passage to finish with. So to recap, what can we learn from Acts 17? Firstly, let's not let setbacks deter us from our zeal for the gospel. Secondly, let's be willing to be people who turn the world upside down for the sake of the gospel. Thirdly, let's emulate the Bereans and read and enjoy and learn and live by scripture. And fourthly, let's know our calling because each of us has a place and a purpose in God's kingdom. Each of us has value. No one is more important than any else, anyone else. Amen.